It's entitled Statement of Congressman Ron Paul, United States House of Representatives. The war that's not a war, July 1st, 2010. In January 1991, we went to war in the Middle East against Saddam Hussein, Iraq's dictator who was our ally during the Iran-Iraq war. A border dispute between Kuwait and Iraq broke out after our State Department gave a green light for Hussein's invasion. And I just have to stop right there, and I remember that, and it's just, it is absolutely criminal. It is murder uh, of, and, and treason, what our president and our Congress did, and they are the ones, as he points out here, who did give them the green light to go ahead and do this. They set Saddam Hussein up for invasion. Okay. After Iraq's successful invasion of Kuwait, we reached with gusto and have been militarily involved in the entire region, 6,000 miles from our shores ever since. This has included Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Pakistan Yemen, Yemen uh, Somalia. After years of killing, a couple of trillion dollars wasted, and only, not only does the fighting continue with no end in sight, but our leaders threaten to spread our bombs of benevolence on Iran. For most Americans, we are at war, at war against a tactic called terrorism, not a country. This allows our military to go any place in the world without limits as to time or place. But how can we be at war? Congress has not declared war as required by the Constitution. Thank God he points that out. I mean, we have to abide by the law. You're a criminal if you don't abide by the law. They don't abide by the law. We're, we go to jail, and I'm interrupting this obviously, I'm going to continue in just a second, but we go to jail if we live outside of our means and we go into massive debt and do the criminal financial dealings that they're doing, we would be in jail. Amen. But they get away with it. They do it all the time. And uh, uh, so that's a very important point there. How can we be at war? Congress has not declared war as required by the Constitution. <laughs> I mean, you would think that alone. That, that ought to just be a done deal that uh, we can count on our government to do the right thing. <laughs> yeah. That is true, he says, but our presidents have, and Congress and the people, have not objected. And that's true. And of course, why haven't the people objected? Because they've didn't been so dumbed down, they don't even know that they should object about it, first of all. Well, the ones that do feel like they have to. Yeah. You know, only the ones that are knowledgeable are objecting. And he's, thank God for Congressman Ron Paul. Um, Congress obediently provides all the money requested for the war. People are dying, bombs are dropped, our soldiers are shot at and killed. Our soldiers wear uniforms, our enemies do not. That's interesting. They are not part of any government. They have no planes, no tanks, no ships, no missiles, no modern technology. Think about that. And we can't defeat this enemy over there. I mean, if that isn't the hand of God against us, I'd like to know what is. And it's phony. That's right. What kind of a war is this anyway, if it really is one? If it was a real war, we would have won it by now. A Amen. Thank you, Ron Paul, for pointing that out. He continues, Our stated goal since 9-1-1 has been to destroy Al-Qaeda. Was Al-Qaeda in Iraq? Not under Saddam Hussein. Our leaders li lied. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting the way he states that. Our leaders lied us into invading uh, Iraq and deceived us into occupying Afghanistan. There's still really no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and only a hundred or so Afghani Afghanistan 
in Afghanistan, yet there is no end uh, in sight to the war. Could there have been other reasons for this war that is not a war? Military victory in Afghanistan is elusive. Does anyone really know whom we are fighting and why? Why has the war not ended? Nine years and it has continued to spread. Some claim it is to keep America safe for our soldiers in fighting and dying for freedom, defending our Constitution. Are we being lied to in order to keep us in this a spreading war just as we were lied to in 1960s to keep us in Vietnam? We, we owe the Iraq government as we do Afghanistan. We own the Iraq government as we do Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we are fighting the Taliban, those dangerous people with guns defending their homeland. Once they were called uh, Mujahideens. I may be pronouncing that wrong, probably am. What? Okay. Our, our allies, also with Osama bin Laden, in the fight to oust the Soviets from Afghanistan in the 1980s. And that is absolutely true. In that effort, our CIA funded radical jihad against those nasty foreign occupiers, the Russians. What gratitude. Those same people now resent our benevolent occupation with a little benevolence uh, with a little violence thrown in. The resistance to our presence grows as our presence wanes. Our people are waking up, but not our official but not our officials refuse to recognize the longer we stay, the greater is the support of those dedicated to the principles that Afghanistan is for Afghans who resent our foreign occupation. The harder we fight a war that is not a war, the weaker we get and the stronger become our enemies. When our enemy without weapons can resist an army of great strength, the most powerful of all history, one should ask, who has the moral high ground? Military failure in Afghanistan is to be our destiny. Changing generals without changing our policies or our policymakers perpetuates an agony and delays the inevitable. This is not a war that our generals have been trained for. Nation building, police work, social engineering is never a job for for foreign occupiers and never an appropriate job for soldiers trained to win wars. A military victory is no longer even a stated goal of our military leaders or our politicians as they know that type of victory is impossible. The sad story, as he concludes with, this war is against ourselves, our values, our constitution, our financial well-being, and common sense. And at the rate we are going, it is going to end badly. What we need are honest leaders with character and a new foreign policy, end of quote from Congressman Ron Paul. And, uh, well, he wasn't quoting the Word of God, but I'm going to give a hearty amen to what he said. I agree. I believe, believe those principles are from the Word of God. Uh, what he is talking about there. Now we are going to continue in our series of um, milk and honey. And we're looking at this in a spiritual way here because there are spiritual qualities, biblical qualities concerning milk and honey that is, is why we're looking at this. And it also has kingdom application and kingdom principles. And I think that as the kingdom people, we're all interested in aspects of the kingdom of God, are we not? We, we certainly ought to be. Last week I got a little bit off on the uh, subject of, of racism. And I'm not going to get back on that this morning, uh, but I do want to make this comment because I am going to talk about covenant to you with you a little bit this morning anyway. And in, in regards to the Abrahamic covenant, I want you to think about this. God Almighty made an eternal, everlasting covenant with the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? Amen. Uh, we're talking about all the tribes of Israel who multiplied and became a multitudinous people. And, and uh, the, the number, as the Bible says, 
would be as the stars of the heaven, and we talked about that, that there were over, what was it, the, the estimated last estimate was 76, six trillion or six trillion, something like that. I, 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 I'm sorry, my mind doesn't go that far ahead. I mean, when you get past a million with me, the brain kind of shuts off to a certain, I can't even comprehend the national debt at 14 trillion, sorry. And uh, again, these guys that think that, oh, the, the godly answer is to pay off that national debt. No, the godly answer is to cancel the national debt, kick the, the uh, Federal Reserve out of our nation, get back to godly just weights and measures and a godly money system. And believe me, we can do that. I mean, the people act like, my gosh, for 6,000 years, man hasn't been able to exist without the Federal Reserve around. Thank God the Federal Reserve is here. Well, for 6,000 6, years, we, we've existed quite well in many cases, without the Federal Reserve. Oh. And the question would be, how well are we doing with the Federal Reserve today? Why well, just look at the fruit of it. We're not doing well at all. No. Now, uh, again, I don't want to get too far off point here, but I do want to make this comment uh, at the beginning concerning the, the uh, Abrahamic covenant. And it is written to, God Almighty gave that covenant to a people. He didn't give it to all the people and all the nations. He gave it to Israel. Amen. And therefore, we could say, Glenn Beck, that the Abrahamic covenant is racist. <laughs> could we not? Yes, sir. If we want, I mean, you want, we could extend that definition out to certainly include uh, the uh, seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. And the, the point is, is that bad? Well, obviously it's not bad. Now, we come along and we say, you know what? And those people who are the children of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, are not the Jews. Now, people will look, look at that Abrahamic covenant today, and they conclude that the, uh, the seed of Abraham are the Jews. Well, let's just stop right here and think about that just momentarily. I'm not going to get real deep into this, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist when you look at the 12 tribes of Israel and you realize that, you know, there's uh, Judah, Benjamin, Reuben, Simeon, Issachar, different names. All of them had different names, right? The Jews are not and never have represented all 12 tribes of Israel. They, they would only be one if you narrowed that definition down, and that biblical definition would be, as I pointed out last week, I believe, of Judah, of the tribe of Judah. But again, they, most people today ignorantly refer to the 12 tribes or the remaining people of the Abrahamic covenant as Jews today. I don't know how many times I go into, let's say, a Christian bookstore, and I'll pick up some commentary or some... Uh, Judeo-Christian authors writing about the uh, children of Abraham, and he will refer to them throughout all of his writings as the Jews. And nobody questions that fact. And of course, people are even afraid to question that fact today, because if you do, why, you're anti-Semitic somehow. Uh, that's another definition that we'd have to get into and define, but people, again, don't understand that words have meaning and meaning have words, and we better understand that. Otherwise, forget using the language, the English language, and quit defining them. We'll just say anything we want to. Ijalabat. We'll just make up a word, and that means uh, eat more ice cream. I don't know. I mean, words have meaning and meaning have words, and let's stick to it. Can you imagine? It's like saying two plus two is win. As we've been told before, they use the example, why that equals, well, we know four, but people will come along and kind of twist that to somehow mean something different than that. No, two plus two equals four. It always has and always will equal four. It does not equal five. Amen. But if you tell a lie long enough and often enough, as they say, what happens? the people eventually start believing it as the truth and they will claim it and state it. And when the media and our government, et cetera, and churches today start repeating that lie over and over again, guess what? The people start believing it. 
And also a peer pressure develops from that where nobody wants to be the odd man out and so we're all going to agree with it because it's not popular you know, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we, we don't want to be thought of as unpopular or unsociable. We want to be thought of as an accepting, loving people. Well, I do too. But I, don't, I just happen to believe that being truly accepting and loving is not living a lie and teaching a lie and believing a lie and repeating a lie over and over again. If I'm wrong on something, I want to correct it. How about you? Don't you think that's a godly way to do things? I mean... Religiously, if I'm wrong on something, and you can absolutely prove to me that I am wrong on something, guess what? I'm going to change, and I have a biblical obligation, so do you, to change if we are wrong on something. So it's kind of important to get some of these principles out of the beginning. And again, if this Abrahamic covenant is as I described it, and I believe I'm absolutely correct in it, then it's a racist covenant. I don't want to dwell on that, but I just want to state the fact that, you know, Glenn Beck is always uh, praising the Jews, and the, and the Jews are God's covenant people and stuff like this. Well, you know what, Mr. Glenn, Mr. Beck, if that's your definition and that's who you claim that they are, I just want you to know that you have a racist belief and a racist doctrine. Amen. <laughs> but there is a covenant that we are to respect and that we are to uphold, and that is the Abrahamic covenant. And that Abrahamic covenant is encompassed also within the new covenant. Now again, let's just get this on record here. How many know what the new covenant is? Does anybody know what the new covenant is? Well, I know most of you are shaking your head in this room, but New Covenant is from Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8 through 11, which says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. It says that. It doesn't say I'm going to make a new covenant with all the people and all the races. So, first of all, if the new covenant is with the Jews as Glenn Beck would say, and the Judeo-Christian world out there would say. Uh, uh, by the way, I want to just stop here just a second here and make this little notation here too. Glenn Beck is a Mormon. And I just want to point this out. That if you go back in Mormon history, they taught a lot of the Anglo-Israel message. They always mix the Jews in. Now you go back to the early a lot of the 1800s and the writings on the Anglo-Israel message or British Israelism, actually that, there's a little bit of a difference there, trust me on that. But anyway, the British Israel, let's just say, they taught that they are Israel. We are Israel, but the Jews are, you know, Judah, that we're part of it. But what was interesting to me, some of them graduated to the understanding, and, and I, I don't want to confuse some of you, some of you are new to this, but the Germans actually have more of a, uh, bear more of the marks of Judah than, than, um, uh, than England or, or uh, Great Britain. I do know that a lot of the monarchies were German. Now, some people are not aware of that. But the, 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 the thing about this, this, this uh, idea of of the British people being of Judah, which some of them claim, uh, that's confusing to me. So I just want to ask some of these British Israel people, are, uh, are you telling me that the Jews founded England and that the Jews, again, represent uh, Israel and its greatness and a part of that? Because that's what some of them are saying. Well, you can't mix the fact that we, the Anglo-Saxon, the Celtic people, which are over there in England right now, we are Israel and have a separate category here of the Jews and that we are all brothers and sisters and we together, Jews and, and England, we represent Israel. Well, that's insanity. Do you understand that? I mean, how can that be? Now, if you say that the German population represents, for the most part, Judah, and that they, they bear the marks of Judah, 
and you look at their banners and their symbols, I'm not getting all in this right now, that has a lot more credibility to me in this understanding. And then when you get over here to the United States of America, and I, I still love the book that uh, Dr. Snook wrote that we have. It's called America 13 or All 13. I believe that's the correct title of it. And it is a fantastic little booklet about the United States being the emergence of all the tribes of Israel coming forth over here as a future prophetic um, uh, fulfillment you know, of a lot of different covenants in the Bible and that America does represent the end time kingdom and I do believe that eventually the America, the, the, our nation here is going to grow and become that fifth kingdom which would represent what? The kingdom of God. Hey, if I'm wrong on that, I'm wrong. But I think I have just as much if not more evidence to prove that point than the Jews do that they're God's chosen people over there in Palestine. When we want to mix, when we want to compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. Um, but Glenn Beck, what I'm, my point was is that uh, the, a lot of these Mormons, though, did teach a form of what I'm teaching you here today. I have, I have old Mormon Israelite books. Don't make the mistake in thinking in your head, oh, then this, this is just a corruption. You're just a form of Mormonism. No, we're not even close. We do have some similarities. If you want to use that ridiculous argument, oh, you're, you're Mormons. No, we're not. First of all, I'm a former Baptist. I have no, I have no Mormon connection whatsoever. But I do have some similarities in teachings, biblical teachings from the Catholic Church that we actually teach here. What are they? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You just guess. <laughs> People want to get off point here. I'm not getting off point on that. Uh, we have some similarities with the Methodist. We have some similarities in teachings with the Quakers. It certainly also isn't on pacifism, by the way. Uh, we have some similarities with a lot of different Christian faiths. Does that mean that we are them? No. Or we, we came from them? No, we came from the Word of God. We believe all of our teachings come from the Word of God. I don't get up here and say, well, uh, our founder was the Pope. Or our founder was Roger Williams. Remember old Roger Williams, one of the Baptist uh, uh, missionaries in America? Okay, We don't claim any of that. We claim the Word of God. We go to the Word of God for what we believe. We can't back it up in the Word of God. I'm certainly not going to go to some other denomination, Christian denomination, and use that for justification for what we believe. So, well, it kind of helps teaching on this a little bit. Some people are kind of wondering a little bit where we're coming from. And what I told you is the absolute truth. We, we go to the Word of God. We, we extract who we are. We extract our beliefs. We extract our faith. We, ex, we extract our our doctrine from the Word of God. Doctrine is not bad. Jesus said the Word of God says came teaching doctrine. It just depends on what doctrine you have. There are good doctrines and there are bad doctrines. There are doctrines of men and traditions of men which will lead you astray and deceive you, which most of the churches have today and are operating on. By the way, I have to comment on this today. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing that to mind. There's this author that the world and the media worships, and her name is Anne Rice, am I saying that? No, Anne Rand. Anne Rand, Anne Rand Anne. the author that, uh, yeah. that okay, the wrote, the wrote the book on, what was it, vampires and other weird stuff? Yeah. Anyway, the world just loves her. And I remember some months ago, they were all, they were making, having a big to-do about it. Uh, what's her name again? Anne Rand. Anne Rand converts to Christianity. And of course, she's one of their big time intellectuals and they had interview after interview. I mean, they couldn't wait to get an interview with her and, 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 and uh, do an interview about her conversion, her newfound conversion to Christianity. And oh, what a lovely, beautiful thing that this was. The other day, it comes out, she says, I'm leaving Christianity. Oh, they couldn't wait. That to get 
uh, uh, interview after interview. I mean, uh, there must have been four or five stations that did big time interviews and they announced it, you know, stay tuned, we're gonna have this interview with her, you know? And she's left Christianity. Well, can you, does anybody know why she, without knowing, if you know why, I don't wanna hear it, but if you, if you, can you take a guess as to why she has left Christianity? Because probably the mainstream churches that she got hooked up with when she got born again, she saw she's a brilliant woman. Her writing's good. I, I've read some of her stuff. About somebody else, though. She's she writes. She died. Anne Rand died a long time ago. So you're talking about a current author. Yeah. I'm talking about a current author that's still alive. So y'all, okay, y'all are messing uh, me up here. Okay. I thought her name was Rise. <laughs> yeah. It is. Okay, see, I had it right to be. Why didn't you speak up? You let these ladies lead me astray here. See, the woman, be quiet in the church. Remember that, women. Uh, all right, and let's get back to I was right and Rice. So, now, the point is, is that they did this interview, and so I was watching it on the evening news the other day with um, uh, one of these guys. I can't remember what his name is. It's not important. No. But anyway, does the interview, and, and why? Here's the big question. Why have you left Christianity? Because they're against uh, homosexuals, and they are, I've learned that Christianity is prejudiced and discriminating, and it is horrible the way that these treat these wonderful people that are homosexuals. And they have every right to get married. They have every right to live their life and to do that. And Christians are just bigoted, hateful people. Can you believe that? What did you become a Christian for? Is that something you just learned as you got into the Catholic faith is what she's a part of. As you got into that? It is, it is insanity. And you know what, though? She is right that the Word of God speaks out against that lifestyle. Amen. The Bible says, if a man lives with another man as he does with a woman, you slap him on the wrist and tell him don't do it. And if they do it again, then you send him to the room for a week. Oh, no, it says you put him to death. Amen. Hallelujah. It is a capital offense, yeah. according to the Word of God. Well, the whole time I grew up with that, of course, in the Baptist church, I was never quoted that scripture verse. As a matter of fact, I can't think of too many Baptist churches. I have heard a few. Uh, the uh, churches of, of, uh, that, are way, that woke up to the um, 501c3, American Coalition of Unregistered Churches, they formed a group like, I've heard, and John Weaver is a part of that. I've heard a number of them do some very strong messages on this and uh, have taught this, and God bless them. But most of your uh, churches today don't teach that, don't bring that fact up. And guess why they don't do it, of course? I think you know. It's because God's law has been put away with. Why? We're not going to teach that. That's God's law. Yeah. We're not under God's law. We're under grace. Yeah. And we have grace to go out and do just whatever we want to. And just become a born-again Christian so you get into heaven. That's the main thing. Well, isn't that what they teach? Pretty much. It is what they teach, guarantee you. Well, you're just kind of cutting it this. That's what I am doing, but it's the absolute truth of what they're teaching. The bottom line of what they're teaching is get saved. You can go out and do whatever you want. The main thing they're concerned, well, are you saved, brother? Are you going to heaven? You could go out and die and get in a car wreck. We just want to make sure you're going to heaven. Well, I want to make sure you're obeying God's Word. I want to make sure that you understand and that you're taught the full counsel of God's Word and you understand why we have laws, why we have society, why we have rules. Why, why would God Almighty bless us and curse us if all we got to do is get saved? Why would there even be chapters in Deuteronomy 28 and 29 on blessings and curses? What would be the point? Why would Jesus say in the Word of God, go and sin no more? Yeah. Hey, just go get saved yeah. and live by grace, whatever that might mean. <laughs> you have grace to go out and do whatever you want. No, that's insanity. You see, 
What I'm talking about here is covenant again. If we don't understand the covenant and if we don't understand who the covenant people are and we don't get the right uh, the principles of that covenant down to, to live by it, again, would that maybe have something to do with the formation of the United States of America did, that our forefathers, our Pilgrim Puritan forefathers who came over here have a covenant understanding? Yes, they did. And it is important. It is important that that is taught. It is important that we elect a president of the United States that understands this. It's important that we understand. Pe we elect people to Congress that understand this. Let me give you some examples on this, if I, uh, if I may, and if I can find them here. Um, first of all, I want to begin with one of my favorites, and this is a quote by... Patrick Henry. He said, quote, I can, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Amen. He didn't say by Buddhists or Muslims or whatever, or Jews even, or Talmudists. He said, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh man, I just... I, I love the, what this man is stating right here, don't you? Would to God that our president would stay, state this and stand on these principles Amen. and say, you know what, you may not elect me again, but this is what America was founded on, and we're having a lot of problems in our nation, and I want to tell you, I don't have the wherewithal to solve all the problems. Hallelujah. But I tell you right now, we need to get on our hands and knees as a people, as a nation, as 2 Chronicles 7, 14 states that we should, and we need to openly declare that we are Christians, as Patrick Henry is saying here, and that our nation was founded. And he's saying it here, he's stating it here. Amen. Who do you think would better know? Obama or these liberals or the progressives? How our nation was founded or Patrick Henry who lived in that day and time? Amen. He goes on to say this, For this very reason, peoples of our faith have been afforded as asylum, prosperity, freedom of worship here. The Bible is worth all the other books which have ever been printed. Amen. Think about that. He's saying the Bible, the Word of God, is more valuable, worth more than all the other books that have ever been printed. That is a phenomenal, powerful statement. Amen. Thank God for Patrick Henry. I want to share this with you from uh, the Mayflower Compact. And uh, it was an agreement between the settlers in Newfoundland, and they drew it up in 1620. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dreaded uh, sovereign Lord King James, now, of course, what they're, you say, well, that's terrible. All they're saying is stating is, is they're making mention of the fact that uh, they are, they came from England, and that was a monarchy, and the ruler of that monarchy it was King James. By the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. Interesting how they bring France into this too, isn't it? Yeah. A king defender of the faith. And by the way, when they're talking about King James, what Bible do we use today mostly? The King James Bible. Amen. And they're declaring that King James, no matter what people may think of him, was a defender, was known and recognized as a defender of the Christian faith. Amen. That's what they're stating here. Having undertaken for the glory of God, and the advancement, please, again, really think about what we're reading here. For the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, think covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. What are they bringing out? 
the principle of covenant here. Is it cold in here? Okay. A civil body politic. Okay. For our better ordering and per preservation and furtherance of the ends of aforesaid, and by virtue hereof, do enact, constitute, and frame such just and, equi and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland the 18th and of Scotland the 54. Uh, Anno Domino, and then it's dated uh, 1620. Pretty interesting, isn't that? Do you think you, we could find other writings and, and speeches and declarations of that? It's throughout their writings. Now, you're not going to read that in the history books today. Why? They could easily be in the Christian, our, our history books in the school, and they should be, so ch children would grow up and learn that we were founded as a Christian nation, and we are to be a Christian nation. There shouldn't be any question about that. And if you don't want like that, and you want to go and be a Muslim, hey, there's lots of different Arab nations you can run to. If you want to be a Jew and be a Talmudist, you can go live in New York City. I mean, oh, well. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Well, I, I want to push them further over. You can go live in Israeli Palestine. If you want to be a Buddhist, you can go to China. If you want to be a Hindu, you can go to India. If you want to be a Mexican, you can go to Mexico. Okay, that's not funny. <laughs> now, I realize there's a lot of good Mexican people that are over here that are Christian, and God bless them. Uh, trust me, I do know there's a lot of them over here. But unfortunately, there's a lot of them over here that are just absolutely ignorant and could care less and hate the, uh, about our nation. They hate America. And those are the people that I stand against. And, and I say, leave our country. And I ha don't have any hesitation about saying that. My little boy uh, was at the uh, thrift store. You can get things cheap, and we happened to go there and buy things because uh, that's how we get a lot of our clothes. But nonetheless, uh, he was over there at the thrift store uh, a couple of weeks ago with my wife, and, uh, and I take credit for the fact that if I was there, it wouldn't have happened. But, <laughs> no, she let him get it because it was a soccer shirt. It had Mexico on there. And uh, some days ago, we, uh, we had to go to the uh, dental office because she had to get a root canal and some other things. It was, her teeth were... I mean, her jaw was really in a lot of pain, so we just, we absolutely had to go. And we uh, stopped in to get a little Mexican food at this place uh, down there in Spokane. And uh, this Mexican lady comes up and waits on us, and she just fell all over herself praising Mike's little shirt, which said Mexico on it, you know. And uh, I'm just, I'm looking at that for a while there, and I'm thinking to myself, quietly, it's like, why would you love Mexico? Again, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not asking. I would like to have asked her, let me stop here, lady, for a minute. Now, I know you're of Mexican heritage. It's quite obvious. And you ought to be proud of who you are. I really believe that. I, you, you, whatever skin color you are, you ought to be proud of that and be happy of it. It doesn't mean you endorse everything your race agrees or believes or does. It's just like me and my white race. There's a lot of stupid white people out there that I do not want to be associated with. But I love my race, and I do what I can to support my race and my heritage. Nonetheless, oh, she just acted like Mexico was the greatest thing since whatever. You know, like they say, sliced bread. I'm like, why? Uh, if you like Mexico, and you think Mexico is so great, why don't you go back there, first of all? Nobody likes to talk about that. Why are you here in the United States of America? In fact, why, to a lot of these Mexican people, why are you over here in the United States of America if you don't love it and you don't want to live by its laws? Get out of here. Amen. Go back to Mexico. Yes. 
Or go bless the blacks in Africa and, and, and take a quick ship over there and, and settle down there. I don't care. Just get out of here. You think, I, I mean, I don't apologize for that. Uh, is, but the point again is, why are some of these people here? It's like, I have to pick on our people from time to time too. It's like, God bless America, and I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And, oh, President, we salute you because you're the President of the United States. Well, now, let's just hold on here just a little bit. Why are we proud uh, to be an American? Does that mean that everything our government, does that mean that because everything our government does, we love it, and we're proud to be here in America? Well, I'm not. I don't want to go anywhere else. I don't want to live anywhere else. Why not? Because there's anywhere else to go that's better than America, as bad as it is. I mean, I got a, I got a note from some people over there. They want, uh, 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 some of our people want to go live in Mexico. Well, they can get cheap land down there, and there might be some benefits in going down there, but I think they're stupid for doing that. <clears throat> I think God's placed us here. And I kind of have a problem with people, you know, when problems start developing, they run. No, I think you need to stay here. I think you need to be fruitful and multiply, and I think you need to let the light of Christ shine and not run from our problem. Amen. You know, God bless the people of the Alamo. Amen. They didn't run from their problem. I'm not saying everything they did, and they were perfect godly men, but they stood their ground. Amen. And we need people that understand the importance of standing our ground. Yes. So... Again, people are running from our nation here, but, and, and they're mad at the way things are, but we have to get back to, to framing ourselves within the proper biblical context that the Word of God tells us that we should do. We, it's not all that complicated when you get down to brass tacks on this. Our forefathers, just looking at this covenant they, they drew up, it's not all that technical. They came with simple ideas, simple concepts from the Word of God, and they derived the type of people and their heritage and their foundation from the principles from the Word of God. We can do the same thing. We can covenant in Babylon. I believe we're in mystery Babylon, but we can covenant in Babylon to come out of Babylon. We can make essential documents that we can draw up and we can commit it to our God in prayer because we recognize that if it's through our might and power, we're in a lot of trouble. But if we commit it unto our Heavenly Father, we ask Him for the strength and the vision and the understanding to go forward and do what He wants us to do, we will do it in faith and we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And I don't care what Babylon's doing out here, we can take this nation back in the name of Jesus Christ for His kingdom. That's what I want to see. And again, there's people out here that are listening to this that want all the answers right away. Hey, you don't get the answers until you walk in faith. As you walk in faith, God Almighty will open the light and the truth to show you what to do at the right time. But He wants to see if you're going to be faithful, first of all, in the small things. We've got to be faithful in the, even in the small... We can't, our people can't even be faithful in the small things. How can we expect to be uh, great leaders when we can't even do the small things. Now, um, I want to read one other thing here. I want to put this on uh, this message. And this is from uh, concerning George Washington. I'm taking this from the book. I'm not a big fan of Tim LaHaye, but it's, uh, he's, it's a pretty good book here. He's got here, Faith of Our Founding Fathers. Here's what he says on page 63 concerning George Washington. Quote, He, George Washington, reached New York in time to be inaugurated on April 30th, 1789, stepping out onto the outdoor balcony of the Federal Hall in full view of the assembled multitude, he requested that a Bible be brought, having placed his right hand on the open Bible. He took the oath of office, and then, embarrassed at the thunderous ovation which followed, did you see embarrassment from Obama at the thunderous ovation he got? I didn't, I don't think so. 
the peeling, uh, the peeling church bells and the roaring of artillery, the new president went inside to deliver an inaugural address to Congress. Speaking with a gravity which verged on sadness, his voice deep and tremulous, he went further than he had ever gone before in stressing the role of God and the birth of the nation. He said, quote, It would be perpetually improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplication to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of the nations, and whose providential aid can supply every human defect, that his benefit benediction can consecrate may consecrate, consecrate on the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States no people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which c conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency we ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. End of quote. Again, would to God that that was taught in our schools in America. Barbara, you're kind of waving there, so let's see. Um, I want you to please turn in your Bibles to Revelation 21. We've read this before, and I want to go back there, though, because it's a very important key fact here we want to look at. <clears throat> I, I want to state this too. I have believed, and you all know this, that I believe that the United Nations is an abomination. And I believe that they knew what they were doing. I believe that the United Nations is a conspiracy against our nation, and it has furthered the advancement and the attack against Christianity and against our nation. And I believe that that United Nations needs to be torn down. Amen. Um, you know, and I, I um, <laughs> well, there's some things I could say on that, but uh, that suffice for now. Let's look here in Revelations 21 and verse 1. I think the visions in the Bible are very, very important. And there are a lot of them. But here's an important one for, for sure. We'll start reading verse 1 here in Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Again, that's referring to the kingdom. Uh, the heavens refers to government and the authority. And it's on earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there is no more sea. Uh, now, seas represents masses again. I believe that democracy, this literally is saying democracy is going to be gone. Democracy is the religion of the masses. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, not the old Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, Zion, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, is this a city prepared as a bride adorned for her husband? Nonsense. It says that Jesus Christ is coming with His angels, His mighty angels. Another verse says that Jesus is coming, you know, what? It, what's that? Like a thief in the night. But it also said He is coming with the, the sons of God. That he is coming with an army of resurrected saints. Amen. That's what he's coming with. Hell. These resurrected saints are who? They're the overcomers. I hope I'm in, in, in part of that company. Yes. 
I realize I've got a long ways to go, but I think it's all uh, it's a lofty goal and objective for all of us to want to be a part of that. Well, that's who he's coming with. And that's whom he is going to <coughs> establish his kingdom with. The first fruits, the overcomers. Uh, that principle is brought out in lots of different ways in the Bible. That's the New Jerusalem. Um, I need uh, a little drink here, Michelle, if you can get that for me. My throat is not cooperating with me here. Sorry about that, everybody that's watching this. Hazards of preaching from time to time. So it's coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Let me tell you something, folks. This is extremely important what we're reading here. A lot of times if you don't have spiritual understanding and knowledge and you just read over God's word, you think, ho, ho, hum, you know, that's, just, that's nice. The tabernacle of God is with men. And He will dwell with them. Think about what we're reading, please. He will dwell with them and they shall be His people. And God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Amen. Now we're talking about, in these series, um, we're talking about milk and honey, are we not? Yeah. And some of you, I know we're scratching your head over some of this, and like, well, still, I don't quite get, the, get it. What have we gone over concerning spiritually milk and honey it represents god's word right we we cannot grow without the milk of god's word we have to have the milk of god's word what does honey represent well it represents the book the bible we read where the prophets gave it i mean where the angel the lord gave it to the prophets and they did eat it says We have to digest God's Word. But it's talking about tabernacles here. Our bodies are the tabernacle of the living God. Your body is a temple of the living God, is it not? And the Holy Spirit is to dwell in you. That's, the, that's what we should all want. That's what we should all desire. How does, the, how does God Almighty, how does the living Word, Jesus Christ, dwell and tabernacle and manifest himself unto you as you digest God's word. Is it coming, the light coming on a little bit concerning milk and honey now? We need this. And as we digest God's word and he tabernacles, the Holy Spirit grows in us as we do this, then we become living epistles of his word, giving forth his word. You can't go forward and give anybody any encouragement, any uh, blessing, any godly knowledge if you don't have the word within you. How can you come up with any solutions? How can you come up with any answers unless the word of God richly dwells in your heart? And so when we're talking about milk and honey, it is the essence of the kingdom of God, I believe, when our, our eyes are open to it. And again, the Israelites came into the land, and it's, it's it, these picture over and over in the scriptures as a land flowing with milk and honey. God Almighty wants us, this Adamic earth. How did God Almighty create Adam? From the dust of the ground, the earth. He wants this Adamic earth to be filled with the milk and honey and the nourishment of His Word, that we can be living epistles of His Word. That's whom the sons of God are. Amen. And so I want to close now by going to these, these familiar verses in, um, in uh, Romans chapter 8. I think I could hear these verses every day for the rest of my life and never, never grow tired of hearing them. Uh, and they have to do, this whole chapter has to do with, the, with uh, the sons of God. First of all, Romans 8, 14, For as many that are led, led by the Spirit of God, they are who? They are the sons of God. 
Okay? And then it goes on down and it talks about um, uh, verse 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to compare with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That shall be revealed in us. Tabernacles. Why did they have the Feast of the Tabernacles? Why is Tabernacles described and talked about throughout the Word of God? This is the Feast of Tabernacles that we have to come to understand that we're talking about here. People want to come together and have their feast and do this and do that and read God's Word. That's great. But the real fulfillment of it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Isn't that great? For the creature was made subject to vanity. God put us in this world. We're subject to the vanities of this world. Not willingly. You didn't pick yourself. He did. But by reason of, whom, of, of him who has subjected the same in hope because the creature itself shall, this creation, talking about this creature literally means creation, itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God who are what? Who are led by the Spirit of God. Amen. Not according to their mind or power. Their carnal mind is gone. They've lost their mind, as I say. That's a good thing. I want to lose my mind. I want to put on the mind of Christ and be guided by the mind of Christ. Wow. That's ultimate tabernacles, friends. That's the milk and honey that is going to nourish this creation again and restore it. And there will be a true, godly new world order. Let's all stand. We'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray for these messages, not according to my might or power or who I am or anything great that I may have said, but great according to what your word declares only. Father, I, that's why I'm here. I know that I'm not much. I appreciate you loving me enough to use me, and I just pray that I will be found faithful and helping your people really develop into the kingdom people that you want them to be, that your kingdom may grow and that the glory of the Lord, as your word says, will one day fill this earth. Hallelujah. I look forward to that day, and I pray that all of us here can be a part of this glorious manifestation of your kingdom, light, and truth. Amen.